one second. Sergeants, begin your recordings. PC recording is up. Recording to the cloud, all set. Backup is rolling. Okay, thank you. Now, good morning and welcome to today's New York City Council hearing on veterans. At this time, will all panelists please turn on your videos for verification purposes. To minimize disruption, please place electronic devices on vibrate or on silent mode. If you wish to submit testimony, you may do so at testimony at council dot nyc dot gov again that is testimony at council dot nyc dot gov thank you for your cooperation chair we may begin uh, good morning everyone my name is eric dinowitz city council member of bronx's 11th district and chair of new york city council's committee on veterans i want to thank you all for joining us at today's hearing on assistance for veterans seeking to upgrade discharge status I also want to extend a warm welcome to all the veterans here today. As many of our veterans know all too well, a veteran's discharge status can have a profound effect on their entire life after military service. Service members who leave the military with anything less than an honorable discharge, commonly referred to as a bad paper discharge, are often ineligible for many federal, state, and local benefits. Upgrading an adverse discharge status may lead to greater educational, employment, and housing opportunities. It can also affirm a veteran's service and correct an injustice. Historically, many service members received bad paper discharges for performance issues and conduct related to undiagnosed post-traumatic stress disorder and traumatic brain injury, sexual orientation and gender identity, military sexual trauma, and other conduct related to conditions that would otherwise be understood or treated differently today. For example, under the military's discriminatory don't ask, don't tell policy, which was in effect from 1994 to 2011, more than 13,000 LGBTQ plus veterans were unjustly discharged. Even as policies and legislation have been updated, such as the repeal of don't ask, don't tell in 2011, and the passage of the Fairness for Veterans Act of 2016, it has remained the responsibility of each veteran to petition the appropriate discharge review board with the often extensive documentation and legal preparations needed to successfully upgrade an adverse discharge. According to the American Bar Association, without help from a lawyer, fewer than 50% of veterans seeking discharge upgrades prevail. In response to the critical need for free legal services for veterans, the New York City Department of Veterans Services recently announced that it will award $1.5 million over three years to nonprofit legal organizations that assist veterans appealing their discharge status through its Discharge Upgrade Assistance Legal Services Program or the DUALS program. Today, we will also be hearing legislation that I sponsored intro 2354A. This bill would amend the definition of the term veteran in the city charter to additionally include persons who have ser who serve or have served in the active military service, regardless of discharge status or time served. This legislation aims to make city benefits and services available to those service members who may have been adversely discharged as a result of an unrecognized or untreated physical or mental condition related to the military service. This bill would also expand the Veterans Advisory Board from 11 to 13 members, two of whom must be immediate family members spouses or domestic partners, survivors, or caregivers of veterans. The objective of today's hearing is to evaluate whether veterans who have received an unjust discharge have sufficient access to free legal services to appeal the discharge decision and ultimately to restore their full benefits. It is our duty as a city to help our veterans where and when they need it, especially when they are disadvantaged because of unfair or discriminatory policies or because of trauma they faced. It's my hope that today's hearing and legislation will do exactly that. Uh, I am now going to turn it over to our committee counsel, Bianca Vitali, to go over some procedural items. Thank you, Chair. Good morning, everyone. My name is Bianca Vitali, and I'm counsel to the Committee on Veterans from New York City Council. 
Before we begin, I want to remind everyone that you will be on mute until you are called on to testify, and then you will be unmuted by the host. I will be calling on panelists to testify. Please listen for your name to be called. I will be periodically announcing who the next panelist will be. For everyone testifying today, please note that there may be a few seconds of delay before you are unmuted, and we thank you in advance for your patience. All hearing participants should submit written testimony to testimony at council.nyc.gov. At today's hearing, the first panel will be representatives from the administration, followed by council member questions, and then the public will testify. During the hearing, if council members would like to ask a question, please use the Zoom raise hand function and I will call on you in the order in which you've raised your hands. I will now call on members of the administration to testify. Testimony will be pro provided by Jason Lochran, who is the Executive Director of Special Projects for the Department of Veteran Services. Additionally, uh, Vincent Garcia, the Director of Intergovernmental and External Affairs for uh, the Department of Veteran Services will be available for answering questions. Before we begin, I will administer the, er the oath. Uh, Jason Lochran and Vincent Garcia, I will call on each of you individually for a response. Please raise your right hand. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony before this committee and to respond honestly to council member questions? Jason Lochran? You say I do. I do, yeah. <laughs> Vincent Garcia? I do. Thank you. You may begin when ready. Um, uh, pardon me, uh, just one moment. I do want to acknowledge we have been joined by council members Ambry Samuel, Micelle, and Valone. Thank you for joining. Okay, Jason Lochran, you may begin testifying as soon as um, the clock begins. One other clock, sorry. Thank you, Bianca. Uh, good morning, Chair Dinowitz, committee members, and advocates. Um, as Bianca said, my name is Jason Lockhart, and I'm proud to serve as the Executive Director of Special Projects for the New York City Department of Veteran Services. I'm joined today by Vincent Garcia, our Director of Intergovernmental and External Affairs. I welcome this opportunity to testify about the Discharge Upgrade Assistance Legal Services Program, intro 2354, and our services to constituents across the discharge spectrum. To give you a context for this discussion, service members depart from the military service with a discharge of character. These types of service characterizations include honorable, general, under honorable conditions, other than honorable, bad conduct issued by special court martial or general court martial, dishonorable, entry level separation, medical separation, and separation for convenience of the government. It is estimated that 10% of veterans living in New York City hold a less than honorable discharge status. That is one of the seven categories apart from honorable discharge. Spread across all wartime eras, discharges under less than honorable conditions have prevented many veterans from concluding their service with pride and receiving benefits obtained through their service. Many of these veterans have been less than honorably discharged due to behavioral issues linked to service-related PTSD and traumatic brain injury. Additionally, a small percentage of cases are related to discrimination associated with military sexual trauma or MST, or because of the don't ask, don't tell policy that existed in the military for many years. For these reasons, veterans across the country face challenges, including but not limited to financial insecurity, employment difficulty, housing insecurity, low educational attainment, and denial of military funeral honors. For these reasons, in November 2019, the mayor announced a grant program known today as DUALS, the Discharge Upgrade Assistance Legal Services Initiative. DUALS is a three-year, $1.5 million program seeking to address the existing backlog and future need of discharge upgrade services in New York City. This program seeks to provide additional funding to legal service providers who have demonstrated unique expertise and addressing discharge upgrades while managing the sensitivity of client relations for a vulnerable veteran population. Divided between two legal providers, we anticipate this program will be in full swing by the end of fiscal year 22. Through duels, an eligible, an eligible service member will receive legal representation encompassing the full spectrum of services related 
to obtaining a discharge upgrade. As the first of its kind program in New York City, DBS is eager to collect critical, critical information associated with our constituent separation of service that will help forge the future of programs that do not leave any veteran behind. Throughout the city, there is a wide range of services exclusive to the veteran community and even more significant number open to all New Yorkers. Although a veteran's discharge status can affect their opportunities for housing, government employment, residential tax credits, special licensing, donor honors, and other services, DVS will still engage with and inform any veteran, regardless of their discharge status, of benefits they may qualify for. For example, an honorably discharged veteran seeking employment assistance may be eligible for an unlimited number of fee waivers when seeking to take a civil service exam administered by the city, while a veteran with a bad conduct discharge could, would not be eligible for such fee waiver. In either case, DVS will engage with the veteran and inform them of their eligibility for employment opportunities with veteran preferences. While employment is one such example, DVS stands ready to provide all veterans with information about a variety of benefits and services they are entitled to and will support a veteran in obtaining them. Another example in which DVS supported a veteran seeking to upgrade his discharge status is the story of Mr. Needham Mays. Mr. Mays was a Black Army veteran in service during the Korean War. Stationed in Fort Bragg, then Private Needham got into an alteration with a white sergeant, whereupon he was arrested and later discharged from the military under dishonorable discharge. Plagued with this status, Mr. Needham found his mental and physical health deteriorating with thoughts of suicide. Despite this, he pressed on, dedicating his life to becoming an advocate and leader in one of Brooklyn's poorest neighborhoods, where he provided mental health awareness and drug addiction support. He also registered young men to vote and raise awareness of HIV prevention and treatment. When he first applied for a discharge upgrade in 2014, Mr. Needham's request was denied, returning him to bouts of depression and poor health. Never giving up, Mr. Needham tried again, this time with the help of numerous advocates. 63 years after leaving the army, he received his discharge upgraded to honorable. Mr. Needham passed away in 2019 with his unstinting efforts led to his receiving medical care and burial as a veteran. In pursuing this discharge, Mr. Needham was assisted by organizations and advocates who are in this room today, as well as elected officials and DVS staff. Mr. Meadham, like others in this situation, represents a superb example of how one's past should not dictate their future. Thankfully, the Army recognized that as well. One other example in which DVS supports veterans' needs, regardless of their discharge status, is through a partnership with the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development, known as HUD, the U.S. Department of Veterans Affairs, the VA, and the New York City Housing Authority, NYCHA to create the Housing and Urban Development Veterans Affairs Supportive Housing Continuum Program, hud -Bash Continuum. Through this program, DVS has developed a mechanism to support veterans disconnected from critical benefits with a pathway to permanent housing. To date, the program has helped over 200 veterans and their families with a hud -Bash Continuum voucher to secure permanent housing. Aside from veteran-specific services, DVS also assists vet veterans in accessing benefits open to the greater New York City population. For example, since the onset of the pandemic, DVS has been connecting veterans and their families with food assistance programs. While open to the larger population, DVS has sought to provide an outlet and direct connection for veterans seeking food. Through our efforts, DVS has amassed over 103,000 meals through a collaboration with HelloFresh, 33,572 meals through the Bronx Food Initiative, and approximately 600 meals through Get Food NYC. Similar to these efforts, DVS provides assistance for veterans navigating other city programs and services regardless of status. These examples and countless others exemplify DVS's continued success and hard work in connecting veterans with services. Whether through housing, food insecurity, or funeral honors, 
DVS stands committed to connecting veterans with services and benefits. Introduction 2354 seeks to achieve four goals. Codify the practice of providing services to a broad range of veterans and their families. Expand the Veterans Advisory Board from 11 to 13 members. Synchronize board term lengths to better coordinate and provide continuity ad ad advisory functions. And remove obsolete references to job posting requirements. It was only five years ago that New York City took a bold step in leading the nation to create the first large municipal department serving the local veteran constituency. Since then, DVS has expanded its services, offerings, and staff, but, it, but has maintained its principal goal to help those who served others. Regardless of the length or type of service, DVS strives to identify the benefits for which a veteran or their family may be eligible and connect them with the appropriate partner to facilitate the request. In pursuing the amendment set forth in intro 2354, DVS hopes to codify its efforts while serving as a model for cities, both small and large, to rethink what it means to serve and how best the local government can step in where state or federal partners are unable to do so. Before the creation of DVS, the Veterans Advisory Board served as a source of history, policy, and change on behalf of the veteran community. Since its start, the board has expanded to 11 members. DVS is now proposing to increase the number of veteran advisory board seats by two and to expand the opportunity for other constituents, including veterans, family members, widows, or spouses, to be included in an organization that advises the agency directly. In expanding this diversity, our agency can further solidify our connections to the veteran constituency and identify other issues, concerns, or successes on behalf of our community, leading to tremendous change in representation. Further, under the proposed bill, DVS seeks to restructure the board member terms to create more streamlined appointment structure. If adopted, this change would seek to alleviate the confusion surrounding the appointment structure, streamline its process, and provide a more uniform approach to the organization of the board. If passed, this bill will afford the board greater opportunity to dedicate more time and resources advising the agency, thereby developing robust policy benefits, benefiting New York City veterans and their families. Lastly, this legislation seeks to revise existing sections of the law that are no longer applicable. Under the current law, DVS must collaborate with other city agencies to include city jobs in a federal job bank. While DVS con continues to engage constituents seeking job assistance through expanding the veteran fee waiver or through empirebets.com, it is unable to include city job postings in the federal job bank, known as usajobs.gov. Because the site does not incorporate postings for non-federal government offices or organizations, rather its purpose is to provide federal agencies with a single portal to, portal to upload, review, and revise job postings within the federal government. As such, DVS has no ability to upload city jobs onto the federal jobs platform. We thank you for the opportunity to testify on this matter and look forward to any questions you or other committee members may have. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jason. I will now turn it over to questions from Chair Dinowitz. Panelists from the administration, please stay unmuted if possible during this question and answer period. Thank you. Chair Dinowitz, please begin. Thanks very much. Um, first, I, I do want to acknowledge that uh, in the legislation, expanding the board to include uh, family members, because we often thank our veterans, uh, but we don't always thank the family members and those closest to the veterans who are also impacted um, by the sacrifice that our veterans make. make. Um, the families also make a sacrifice. So thank you, you know, for acknowledging that. It doesn't always get the acknowledgement it, it deserves. Um, I, I want to touch on first something you spoke about in, in your testimony. Uh, you spoke a lot about DVS providing services like um, connecting veterans with, with assistance programs that exist at the federal government. You spoke about civil service examination waivers. You help them get those from the federal government. Assistance navigating already existing programs. Um, can you talk a little more about any city benefits or services that are exclusive 
to New York City veterans, not just um, accessing existing food, whether even if it's city benefits, food benefits that anyone can get, are there any city benefits or services that are exclusive to New York City veterans? Yeah, I feel like I can, uh, I can take that one. Sure. Uh, just thank you for the, for the care, uh, excuse me, for the question, Chair. And uh, to answer that question, there are some city specific benefits that are only affordable to veterans. Uh, one such aspect actually is the veteran fee waiver on the New York City local level. So in regards to any of the city exams that DCAS administers on behalf of the city, we're thinking police, we're thinking fire, we're thinking DOC, for example. Um, since June of last year, veterans have been able to access an unlimited number of fee waivers to take those exams. So previously a veteran, if you are of an honorable district status, you were afforded one fee waiver. Moving forward, you're now afforded an unlimited number. So that is something that is specific towards veterans as a whole. Some other programs that do come to mind within the city is uh, the alternative tax credit under DOF, where if you own property and you have a certain district status, as well as wartime era, you're afforded uh, a tax credit on your property. And uh, another example would be under DCWP for veterans that have a uh, street vending license. You have to be a disabled veteran or a veteran under honorable conditions to receive that uh, benefit of being able to, uh, to peddle within the streets of New York. And on these applications, is there a box does, on the examination application? Are they being asked if they're veterans or do they have to know to reach out to DVS in order to access these benefits? So in the applications themselves, there is a, a box and notification for veterans. Um, what I can speak to is on the, uh, the job application site. If you're looking for a fee waiver, it will say, hey, you know, if you're a veteran and you're looking for a fee waiver, make sure to send a copy of your DD-214 to this entity. And then they'll, they'll double check on that end. Uh, but separately, all that data is thankfully compiled under uh, Local Law 23, which is where we take it then to see like how many veterans are getting these services and how best we can assist and more expand the word afterwards. Okay, so going back to discharge status upgrade, a veteran yeah. contacts DVS. So what's the process? Walk us through from beginning to end, the veteran contacts DVS. What happens then? Sure. So in that uh, initial call, right, that veteran's calling DVS, um, uh, you know, live person on the DVS side is picking up that phone call and they're conducting an intake. In that intake, they're taking uh, pertinent information, that individual's name, uh, their rank, if anything, within the military, what military branch they serve, whether they're a family member or the veteran directly. And then that also part is what is it that you're looking for, you know, veteran A, and then what's your discharge status? So based on what it is that they're looking for, let's say employment, and let's say, hey, you know, I'm an honorable veteran or honorably discharged veteran, and I'm looking for employment assistance, right? What DVS then does in that triage is goes, based on your status, here are the plethora of benefits that we can connect you with, and let's then connect you with things that you're eligible for. So they're able to do that triage initially, and then work with that veteran as time goes on in the event there's any other service requests that they're looking for, any questions that may be answered, or uh, whatever it is that, that may come to the veteran's mind that we can help with. And what's that breakdown? I mean, you have Vet Connect, you have uh, phone calls. What's the breakdown of how people are reaching out to DVS? Uh, I can uh, circle back with you on just the, the manner of breakdown, Chair, uh, but I can assure you that um, a lot, of, whenever we have these service requests, they're ultimately entered into that United Vet Connect system. And that's how we keep track of any of the requests, the time at length, the nature of the request, and what process it is in, uh, I guess you can say, in the life cycle of what their firm is. Okay. Uh, and Chair, I just want to uh, add into that answer and that the, the breakdown is uh, by the VetConnect website. We have a form on there that you can fill out to, to request services. Uh, we receive phone calls regarding services. We also uh, field service requests through city council offices and other organizations just reaching out to us. But one thing that uh, we feel very proud of at, D at DVS in our inheritance of the VetConnect contract was expanding the network to allow for service providers to make referrals to one another without them all having to go through DVS as well. So speaking of expanding that, right, intro 0647, it, it just passed the city council earlier this month. Uh, it requires DVS to coordinate with veteran service organizations to establish a hotline to provide peer support services and information to veterans. So would DVS consider using the hotline 
in addition to what you're already doing as a way to educate callers about this discharge upgrade status process, as well as provide referrals to clients for free legal services to assist with their discharge status upgrade paperwork. Yeah, and I can uh, I can take that one chair, and uh, and I would say you know we're we're more than happy to explore that that opportunity that idea um, once we are able to uh, to lock in the providers that are manning that hotline under the uh, the intro we're more than happy to work with them and see if that's something we can we can throw into the mix. Yeah, I think I think outreach is is a huge uh, component of the work that you are doing and, and need to do. Um, Absolutely. Right. And yeah, I think we all agree. It's, it's what good is a program if people don't know about it. Right. Absolutely. Um, so this committee actually held its last hearing on discharge upgrades assistance for veterans in 2018. And at that hearing, the DVS commissioner, Lori Sutton, testified that DVS had received 105 service requests for discharge upgrade status in 2018. Um, I'm wondering if you have the numbers for, for FY 2020. What was the total number of requests for discharge upgrade assistance? If you have an estimate of the total number received in FY21. Yes, sir, I'm, I'm happy to, to take that question. Um, as of right now, our numbers for FY20 is uh, 36. Let me just make sure that I confirm on that. Yes, it is 36 for FY20, and then we have 46 for FY21. I think what's important to note in this distinction is really just the focus on, on discharge upgrades and also the increase from, from year to year, from 20 to 21. Um, uh, unless my, uh, it, but it, in, you know, in 2018, they, you received 105 service requests. Mm -hmm. so, um, that is, yeah, I'm sorry, go ahead, Chair. No, please. Uh, so uh, correction on my part though, for FY20 it was 37, not 36, but FY21 still stands at 46. So I apologize for that. Um, in regards to FY2018, uh, we are uh, looking into that number and really being able to finalize what that data is based on the, the differences. For your awareness chair, uh, in October of 2020, we switched on over from the VetConnect contracts and not the Unitas platform and being able to track our mechanisms and better aggregate data that way. So FY 2018 uses uh, our CRM and we're just working through to confirm those numbers and see how that breakdown was done. Okay, because you know, I'm looking for trends to see if more and more people are being helped, especially um, you know, since the enactment of the New York State Restoration of Honor Act in 2019, if, if that has had an impact on the service requests for discharge status upgrades. Yeah, what I can say uh, at this time, Chair, is that we can, Definitely look into that and see what that trajectory is going. Um, but based on some of the trends that we're seeing right here, we do see increases in you know a variety of different service categories from food assistance to legal in general, uh, to housing, things like that. So there is an upward trajectory in the services that veterans are seeking, especially because the name recognition of DVS has increased. So obviously more veterans are able to come to us. And then with that, being able to assist those veterans in finding those services afterwards. Great, it just, I, I just, I, I'm a little, Pardon me, I'm a little uh, confused about the, the trend because the, the number I have for 2018 is 105 requests for discharge status upgrades. I know you said you're, you're looking at that number. Um, so it seems like even though from FY20 to 21, it went up by nine, but it mm -hmm. seems over the longer term, it's, it's gone down. So I'm just interested to know, you know more about that. Again, especially as New York State passed the Restoration of Honor Act, which you know, seeks to recognize and provide state services for people who were, um, let's say, unjustly discharged or receive other honor, uh, honor before PTSD, for TBI, military sexual trauma, uh, gender identity, and sexual orientation. Chair, yeah. I, I want to, sorry, I want to jump in here. Uh, and Chair, I just want to address that the service providers that we are contracting with also have been experts in this field for many years now. Uh, it's our understanding that, that over the last three or four years that, that this service has been around, um, it's because of those legal service providers that have done their job so well that we're confident that the veteran population who fit this criteria to be eligible for these services have gone directly to those organiza organizations in some cases. Um, you know, DVS is one mechanism for which those uh, those folks can get connected, 
to the providers of the services, but uh, I'm confident that if you spoke to the legal service providers that are receiving the funding for this contract, uh, they would uh, be more than happy to share with you all of the different avenues for which they actually receive uh, the supply of veterans who are seeking this service. So I just want to make, make clear that um, that's part of the reason why we selected these veteran providers and why we get into this contract so that we can have a greater understanding of what trends do exist in the supply of veterans who are seeking out this service. But thank, it's a very good question, Chair, and, and we're getting to the bottom of it. Okay, well, if, if, that, if that is the case, that, that's good to hear. It means the service providers are doing that job, and it also means that data uh, doesn't show everything, right? That there are always things hidden in the data. Um, but just that's speaking on the, um, the, the service providers, um, the, in fall 2020, uh, DVS announced that through its Discharge Upgrade Assistance Legal Services, or DUALS program, um, that $1.5 million will be awarded over three years to nonprofits, assisting the veterans um, challenging discharge status. Um, so you said you've chosen two nonprofits. Uh, which are the nonprofits and how did you go about selecting those nonprofit legal providers? Yes, Chair, uh, we selected the New York Legal Assistance Group and a Veteran Advocacy Project. Um, DVS evaluated the vendor's proposals and ranked each vendor's response to various requirements, such as experience, budget, and capacity. Uh, and in, in this uh, mechanism for which we did this was through a negotiated acquisition. Uh, after which DVS awarded the contract to both vendors based on their high marks on the scorecard. Oh, good, like a report card. And but so yes. now that more, <laughs> now that I, I can't, I can't escape my my teacher brain. Everything. <laughs> uh, so yeah, so that was based on. So you 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 um, provided the contract based on that report card. Are you c uh, currently evaluating? Um, how well these these nonprofits are doing, or how do you quantify the success of this initiative and the success of the nonprofits? It's a very good question, Chair. And uh, really, I want to thank the providers as well for helping us establish, you know, what kind of mechanisms and, and right and right and left boundaries we have in working together to to reach those outcomes. Um, given that we really don't know a lot about the intricate details that come from a discharge upgrade appeal process. Uh, we're really hoping to collect critical information during this process through the reporting structure that we developed every six month period to identify those trends and see what, uh, what cases are turning out to be successful and which cases are turning out not to be successful. And there's a lot of variables that have to do with this. Uh, the process, each case has, to be, has a preliminary investigation there is a process to collect documentation. Uh, and then after that, there's other um, you know, boards within the organizations to select cases that find that that case has merit to continue on and go forth to the discharge review board. Uh, cases that include merit would be those cases that you discussed earlier in your, in your, in your testimony. So what we're looking to achieve here is um, to get those critical details about each unique case and find those patterns and trends that, that actually describe the success of the program. Uh, one thing I wanna note for you here is that one of the key elements about this contract is the reporting requirements go beyond the three years. Uh, this is because the discharge uh, review process uh, could take many, many years. So the legal service providers that we're working with, they'll still be reporting to DVS several years from now, maybe even well beyond the three year period uh, for on cases that may have been submitted in year one. So this is gonna be a marathon, but uh, it's th this very, very important data that we're gonna get that will facilitate the decisions we make as, as a city agency to build better programs that help us reach the outcomes that you uh, council and ourselves would like to reach. Yeah, it's very important. I mean. It's very important to tell you that the success of these programs equals the success of our veterans and their families. So it's really important that this information 
come out that we get this data to know if these programs are successful and if, and if not, how we make them more successful so that all veterans, uh, you know, are really getting the support that they need and we know um, that they're getting the support. Um, so you, you mentioned a timeline. I'm interested to know, so a veteran is referred to an outside veteran service organization um, such as City Bar Justice Center. So what is the estimated length of time it takes for that veteran to be connected with an attorney? So each case is unique, sir. Um, and this all goes back to the intricate details of that client's background, uh, service discharge type. Um, but that is also one of the things that will be included in the reporting requirements for us to understand what proportion of cases have legal representation and which proportions do not. And this also speaks to the importance of this contract. The, the funding for this contract really is dedicated to legal representation um, because um, that is the critical, that is the premium service that we're offering. And it's that that we want to address first. And uh, I'm sure the legal service providers that we've selected here can speak to the, the benefits of that and why there was such a high need for it. But, but that's really our focus. And speaking of the contract, the, the, this $1.5 million, what is the source of this funding? Uh, the funding is uh, DVS funding. So it's a, I mean, what I mean, it's 100% city funding. That is correct. That's, that's correct, yep. I'm sorry, Mr. Garcia, I didn't. Oh, my apologies. So yeah, I, I said that that's correct. It's a, it's baseline within the DVS budget. Okay, good. Um, and so, you know, we, we're talking about, you know, a lot of what, uh, what you mentioned in your uh, opening statement was access to federal benefits, money, dollars coming in for housing, for healthcare, for education, for jobs. And I'm interested, um, how much it, it has enriched, how much money does an honorably discharged veteran with access to those state and federal benefits contribute to New York City's economy versus a veteran who has received other than honorable discharge, who've been deprived of those benefits? That's a very good question, Chair. And uh, it really speaks to how beneficial this, this contract is and how it really pays for itself uh, as, as somebody in the education world, I'll, I'll speak to that benefit. Um, just getting a single individual their access to the GI Bill uh, education benefit that comes from somebody exiting the service with an honorable condition, that one benefit, if it's uh, awarded at 100%, given the time in service and other some cr criteria, uh, that one benefit can lead to um, that single student going to school at one of New York City's educational institutions, upwards to hundreds of thousands of dollars just to the educational institution in, in the form of tuition. Uh, additionally, that single student receives what is known as basic allowance for housing while going to school. And that number range depending on whether they're a part-time or full-time student. But uh, last, last I, I've checked uh, in New York City, if a student is going full-time, using the GI Bill benefits, they're awarded up to upwards of four, $4,300 a month just for cost of living, for which that fund comes back into New York City's economy because that money is spent on housing, food, books, everything that student needs to be successful while they're going to school here in New York City. Right. So I, I just said, I'm sorry, please continue. I'm sorry, Chair. I know that was a mac, uh, micro number, and but we could get back to you on a macro number on what what kind of larger impact we expect with the federal with federal dollars coming into the city of New York. Yes, please please do. You know, you know, it's it's very important we get, and the most important thing obviously is that our veterans and their families are getting the services, right? But we fair. also, you know, we also want to know that, you know, the investment also we sh people should know that this investment you know, more than pays for itself, right? That is correct. Um, in terms of access to federal and, and state benefits. Um, I just have one more question and then I'm gonna turn it back to uh, committee council for other council members to ask their questions. Um, but given how important um, these services are for our heroes and their families, both for those individuals and for the city as a whole, I just want you to talk a little more about 
the specific outreach that you are doing to ensure that veterans who, who, who come home know that they have access to upgrade discharge status assistance? Yes, sir. And uh, very quickly before I address that question, I do wanna make a correction to my last response. I just got the current VAH rate and it's $3,000 and $3,093 a month. So it's not 4,300. And that rate changes every year. Uh, so it, it's subject to the, the benefit and uh, at that time contingent upon where the locality is. But going back to answer your question, um, since the program has yet to launch, uh, DVS hasn't, uh, hasn't uh, participated in a marketing plan specifically for this program. Um, we do expect it to occur within this calendar year, but uh, we do intend to full out blitz our community through, through working with organizations in our VetConnect network, working with our New York state partners and working with the legal service providers that are receiving this contract to perform outreach. Uh, we also would like to work with council to get the word out about this program. Uh, prior to this though, uh, DVS would share information about these legal service groups that existed in our newsletter. And they're also uh, accessible through our VetConnect network for our service providers to make those referrals. If they come across a veteran who uh, openly shares that they have a discharge type that is uh, under the, under other, under than honorable conditions. I'm um, sorry. <laughs> okay, well, I, I look forward to working with you on that, especially as we provide um, that access and those services to our veterans, particularly those who are struggling the most, the most those struggling with uh, homelessness, you know, mental health struggles uh, and the like. I'm gonna turn it back to committee council now. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Sorry, didn't even cut you off there. Um, I will now call on council members in the order they have uh, used the Zoom raise hand function. If you would like to ask a question, council members, and you have not raised um, yet raised your hand in the Zoom function, please do so now. Council members, please keep your question to three minutes. The sergeant at arms will keep a timer and will let you know when your time is up. Uh, you should begin uh, once I have called on you and the sergeant has announced that you may begin. Hold on one second. I think we have council member Vallone. Um, We'll hear from you first. And if I see any other hands as you are asking questions, I will turn it over to your colleagues. Hold on one second. Um, all right, you're not muted. Council Member Vallone. Thank you, Council. Thank you, Chair Dinowitz. Good morning, everyone. Uh, I, I hear, as always, good things. I see a great team coming up to speak. Um, so I just wanted to touch base because you ended your testimony with a quick sentence towards the vague references to the opposition to the bill. And I'm not quite sure what the opposition is. And you just kind of threw it in there at the last second. So can we can we flush that out? What is the issue with either one or both of the bills that we are objecting to? Uh, I'm I'm happy to take over that that question, Council Member. And to um, uh, I guess to clarify, there there is no opposition to the bill. In fact, we we are supportive of of its drafting and everything else like that. I think what the focus of the latter piece of the testimony is that in particular subdivision C and D of intro 2354, uh, its changes are because the bill as written requires DBS to collaborate with other city agencies to post city jobs on a federal job board, uh, which uh, as detailed in the testimony is just something that is not possible for DBS to do because the job board is strictly for federal government agencies and entities to post federal jobs. Um, so are seeking to strike that provision doesn't negate the fact that DVS is working diligently to inform veterans of, for example, the veteran fee waiver for city jobs, connecting jobs of both public and private through Empire Vets, and really just interacting with the constituency to be aware of other employment opportunities. Um, our piece just in that latter part of the testimony is just highlighting the fact that as written within the current law, we are unable to comply with subsection C and D because we are unable to post city jobs on the federal job board. And that's really the preference of it, sir. Excuse me, Pat, but we're not posting. I thought the requirement was finding a federal and state opportunities onto your listings, not that we're going to conversely post our listings on a federal or a state. Or am I getting that wrong? Um, I can just see here, just very 
quickly on I mean, that. And that would be, I mean, we, we can't require a city agency to post on federal and state. That's different. But we should have every opportunity listed for our veterans on our veterans board and our uh, Department of Veterans Services and everything else that's here, whether it's federal, state, local, I don't care where it is. But I don't want the confusion to be that we can't post opportunities for veterans. But I get if there's a concern requiring federal or state to post our opportunities. Yeah, and I, and I agree with you on that, sir. And I think the, the piece is that the legislation requires both, right? It requires us to inform veterans of federal drop postings and state drop postings, which are included within Empire Vets, the whole host of other mechanisms that we uh, interact with veterans in seeking employment opportunities. But simultaneously, the law as written previously uh, required DVS to also post city jobs and coordinate with SBS and DCAS, for example, to do the same on the federal job board. So our reasoning would be to strike the um, piece that we can comply with, which is the posting of federal job boards, but continue what we're already doing in compliance with the law to inform veterans of state, federal, and local opportunities as, as we do right now. Uh, I mean, it sounds like we're going around in circles, but I think it's something that that we don't need to strike. We just need to amend the language and have Chair Dinowitz and his team just figure that out. I, I What we're trying to do is provide as much, not cut things back or list things, because that was the problems in the past was, all the great nonprofits and, and sister agencies posting and doing that and DVS being out of the loop and they would, would be trying to catch up on what services and jobs that are out there. Uh, we want that, that continuity to continue within, within our new agency and, and work with that. I don't want folks having to have their heads all over the place between different listings. Yeah. So I'm not uh, sure we can work language out to make it contiguous and, and not duplicative. Absolutely, sir. Yeah. And we're more than happy to work with the council to find um, the appropriate balance to achieve that goal because we are in complete agreement to make sure that we are providing information that outreach to our constituents about job opportunities. So we're happy to um, to figure out what that word it may be with the council. Thank you, Chair. And just in case there is not, because we're coming up to October and there may not be another hearing or two, it's been an honor to be on veterans for eight years now as I come toward the end of my two terms. So for all of you there, who have guided me through this amazing world and, and being a, a blessing to learn from every one of you, uh, the honor and the sacrifice that everyone has given to give us this great freedom in this country. I say thank you. So God bless everyone. I'm Chair Dinowitz. Thank you for your leadership. Thank you, Councilman. Okay, now I will turn it back to Chair Dinowitz for additional questions. Um, I don't see that any other council members, I'm gonna give it a second. If any other council members have any questions, please use your raised hand function in Zoom. Um, we'll call on you. Okay, seeing as there are no council members with the hand raised function, I will turn it back to Chair Dinowitz for additional questions. All right, I have no additional questions, thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, we have concluded administration testimony. Um, and we'll now be turning it over uh, to public testimony. I'd like to remind everyone that we will be calling on individuals one by one to testify. Uh, each panelist will be given three minutes to speak. After I call on name, your name, a member of our staff will unmute you. There may be a few seconds of delay before you are unmuted and we thank you in advance for your patience. Uh, please wait a brief moment for the Sergeant at Arms to announce that you may begin before your um, before you start your testimony. Council members who have questions for a particular panelist should again use the raise hand function in Zoom. I will call on you after the panel has completed their testimony in the order in which you have uh, raised your hand. Uh, for our first public panel, I would like now I would like to welcome Coco Cahoon, Ryan Foley, and Ashton Stewart. Um, Coco, you may begin your testimony. Time starts now. Hi. I'm Coco Colhane. I'm the executive director of the Veteran Advocacy Project. Um, we provide free legal services to low-income veterans and their families, and we focus on those living with post-traumatic stress, traumatic brain injury, and substance use disorders. We have three areas, criminal defense, uh, civil practice that focuses on housing, and then veterans law, which uh, is centered around veterans with less than honorable discharges. I also sit on the New York State Discharge Upgrade Advisory Board, teach um, at Brooklyn Law School Veterans Law, and uh, sat on the advisory board for the newly published ABA Discharge Upgrade Manual. So I want to thank you. Uh, first, just want to thank City Council for their commitment to this population with the several hearings over the last couple of years, and thank the Mayor's Office and the Department of Veterans Services for this 
contract. And, you know, this is a real commitment to this work. It takes so much time, as we were just discussing, um, just to provide a brief overview of the process, which I think might be helpful. Um, you know, a veteran comes in to us and just ordering records alone can take more than a year, depending on, you know, right now with the pandemic, the National Personnel Records Center has been shut down. Um, so anyone who served before the mid 90s is out of luck and they've been waiting for a year and a half. Um, and the first thing that we do is connect them with mental health care. You know, we make sure, are they getting primary care? Are they, you know, we partner with places like the Community Health Care Network and any other number of different places um, to make sure that they have the resources that they are barred from uh, at the federal level. Um, and so I just wanted to also uh, point out that on the new Mayor's Office of Community Health, there's a new roadmap for all mental health. And there's a statement on the new website that's really fantastic. It talks about how there's no guarantee for mental health at the federal level. And so local communities really have to step in and we have to be there. And that nothing could be more true for this population, right? Um, there, it's less than honorable discharge is the second highest predictor of homelessness. Um, you know, the suicide rate is three times higher for this population than other veterans, which is already um, almost double, I think, than the general population. So we're talking about extremely vulnerable people who need mental health services. Um, so it's disappointing to see that there are no mental health providers in the veteran section on that website. And I know that we all have our lists and have partnerships, and I would hope that those make it onto that site. Um, and um, one of the things that's so important uh, in this process, you know, we work with vets, we connect them to care. They need that mental health treatment because as we go through their case and build, you know, most individuals did not seek mental health treatment in service. So we need medical evidence, but also we're going back through their traumas. They need support, they need care. Um, so we need two different types of psychological uh, services. One I'm treatment, tired. sorry, and also forensic. If I can just wrap up, I just wanna mention the forensic element is so important. And so we're developing a program that we're really excited about um, with Columbia and we hope it'll become a new standard for best practices. Um, and I also just wanna add that I made all sorts of notes about the questions that were coming up earlier and wanna offer data on that and dollar amounts and all that. It's, needed. Thank you for the time to speak today. Thank you so much, Coco. Uh, now we'll be calling on Ryan Foley. You may begin uh, your testimony. Time starts now. Hello, uh, my name is Ryan Foley and I'm the supervising attorney of the Veterans Practice at New York Legal Assistance Group, NILAG, a nonprofit law office dedicated to providing free legal services and civil matters to low-income New Yorkers. Given the need, level of need in New York City's diverse veterans population, NILAG operates two veteran-specific legal programs. We have a medical legal partnership with the Bronx and Manhattan VA Medical Centers and a community-based program that provides comprehensive services to veterans and their families, regardless of their discharge status and eligibility to use the VA healthcare system. Less than one month ago, the longest war in our nation's history, the war in Afghanistan, ended after nearly 20 years. Since 2001, more than 775,000 US troops had deployed to Afghanistan. When the withdrawal was announced, there was a surge in active service members and military veterans seeking mental health support. The Veterans Crisis Line, which provides crucial emergency mental health assistance to veterans, reported a, a significant spike in calls and texts. The secretary of the VA put out a message encouraging former service members who were struggling with mental health to reach out to the VA, stating, we, the VA, are here for you. However, that message may not have reached the estimated 500,000 veterans across the United States who received less than honorable discharges, including more than 100,000 veterans who received less than honorable discharges since the start of the war in Afghanistan. As we've got, as, as has already been mentioned, a less than honorable discharge means a former service member will not be entitled to the full range of benefits that their military service would otherwise grant them. Veterans who received a general discharge will not be entitled to educational benefits, which are crucial for service members transitioning back into civilian life. Veterans who receive an other than honorable or a bad conduct discharge often find they have a complete bar to VA benefits, which includes critical resources such as VA disability benefits and access to VA healthcare. 
Veterans who receive a less than honorable discharge are permitted to apply for a discharge upgrade, but the process is difficult, slow, and near impossible to navigate without a legal advocate. Successful applications require extensive record collection and analysis, which has increased in difficulty as a result of massive backlogs and pandemic closures of important record keepers like the National Personnel Record Center. For veterans dealing with significant mental health conditions, applications may require obtaining detailed medical opinions, explaining how the mental health conditions um, started in service and was a, led, led to the less than honorable discharge. During the pandemic, that has been even more difficult for veterans to be able to access their normal health care providers. Applications also require detailed legal arguments, explaining the errors or injustices that may have occurred during a service member's military service and discharge. Once a discharge upgrade application is submitted, the veteran must then wait for a decision, which depending on the branch of service, dates of service, and whether they requested a hearing may take several years. NILAG is extremely grateful to the, New York, the City of New York for its investment in legal services for veterans. NILAC has been the recipient of funding through the Legal Services for Veteran Initiative since its inception, and because of that funding, we've been able to assist veterans with thousands of cases in the areas of veteran benefits, public benefits, housing, consumer protection, and advanced planning. NILAC is now, um, can I wrap up? Uh, NILAC is now excited to receive funding from New York City Department of Veteran Services, specifically aimed at assisting veterans with less than honorable discharges applying for discharge upgrades. This new funding demonstrates New York City's true commitment to uplifting a veteran population that is frequently overlooked and often most in need. We look forward to working with the city and NYC DBS to make sure our former service members know this assistance is available, recognizing that many individuals eligible for this assistance may not identify as veterans because of their discharge status. NILAG is committed to utilizing our expertise of 300 plus attorneys and paralegals and financial counselors to comprehensively address the different and diverse civil legal needs of these struggling veterans. Thank you so much for the opportunity to testify and I'm happy to engage in further questions. Thank you so much, uh, Ryan Foley. Um, Ashton Stewart, you may begin your testimony. Time starts now. It appears you're still on mute. Stuart, you're muted. Sorry about that. Um, thank you, members of the New York City Council Committee on Veterans for holding this oversight hearing. My name is Ashton Stewart, and I am the manager of SAGE FATS, SAGE's statewide program for lesbian, gay, bisexual, and transgender veterans. I'm also a member of the Intrepid's Council of Veterans Advisors and the New York State Council of Veterans Organizations. And back in the fall of 2019, I was honored to provide requested data to Mayor de Blasio's office in drafting the DUALS program. Support from the New York City Council has been instrumental in our program, and we're so grateful for, for your support. Um, SAGE is the country's old first and largest organization dedicated to improving the lives of LGBT uh, older people. Founded in New York City in 1978, SAGE has provided comprehensive social services and programs for LGBTQ older people for more than four decades. SAGE Vets is one of SAGE's programs, and in fact, is the only program in the state designed for older LGBT vets. Uh, SAGE Vets was created to identify, support, and improve access to care among older LGBTQ veterans around, among, across the city and state, and to respond to the swelling needs described above. Um, I had to cut that part out just for uh, sake of time, and further to elevate the visibility of older LGBT veterans and their unique needs. Sage Vets program uh, works in partnership with the veteran service programs throughout the city to provide legal information and referrals for VA benefits, including medical pension and education. And uh, serving LGBT veterans is a difficult task since most of these individuals served while the military enforced anti-LGBTQ policies followed by the discriminating don't ask, don't tell policy that began in 1994 and lasted for almost 18 years. Recently, we have seen legislative and policy changes that have aided our work, and we applaud the legislators who have championed these improvements. In New York, the Restoration of Honor Act was signed into law in 2020, providing an opportunity for LGBTQ veterans who are discharged with an OTH discharge with an opportunity to have their discharge upgraded to honorable, thereby granting them access to veteran benefits offered by the state. Also, just last week on September 20th, the 10-year anniversary of the appeal of Don't Ask, Don't Tell, the VA announced it will reverse harm done to LGBTQ plus veterans by offering health care and benefits to veterans discharged under the Don't Ask, Don't Tell policy. This announcement will go far in aiding the estimated 14,000 veterans who were discharged under this discriminating policy, but unfortunately, it does nothing for those estimated 100,000 who were discharged for being LGBTQ 
between World War II and 1994 when Don't Ask, Don't Tell began. Additionally, through our work, we discovered another policy gap for veterans who are ineligible for the VA despite the new policy announced last week. In 1980, the VA enacted a requirement for veterans to serve a minimum of 24 months of active, active duty in order to qualify for health care and services. Even with an honorable discharge, we have seen veterans deny care of the VA when they fall short of the 24 month requirement. This includes those who were discharged for sexual orientation and gender identity. And we are actively working with the New York City Department of Veterans Services on addressing this policy gap, seeking a legislative solution and together have discovered that there are close to 10,000 LGBTQ veterans who are discharged within the first 24 months of their services. Sage Vets Works, uh, may, I, may I just share this personal story, uh, this anecdotal, um, Sage Vets Works on a case-by-case -case basis, advocating on behalf of uh, veterans. And this year we nominated a 54-year-old veteran who was a victim of MST into the state, veterans, state Senate Veterans Hall of Fame. His name is Gaston Roberge, and up until this year, he did not consider himself a veteran. He hails from a long line of military men and women growing up in a military family who dreamed of a lifelong career in the U.S. Army. And as a young cadet and the junior ROTC program, Gaston was groomed to realize his dream. But unfortunately, a traumatic event occurred during basic training that abruptly ended his career and made a detrimental impact on his future. Um, it happened in 1987. And 35 years later, he connected with Sage Vets, and we have been working with him. Um, we've got him some help. We got him this nomination with his Senator Brad Hoyleman. Uh, he is now, uh, he got a Section 8 voucher uh, as a veteran status and got placed at the top of the list. And we're helping him get housing for he and his mother, who he is care caring for. It's been in complete isolation caring for her for over eight years. It's a remarkable story. But this is just one story of one individual who was affected by uh, the, the veteran status. So this effort that you're doing here in the city is monumental. It's inspiring. The Restoration of Honor Act sizzled and it went out across the nation. And there's five states now with similar legislation. And I think that this is the first step on uh, encouraging other cities and administrations to uh, consider allowing people to consider themselves a veteran um, during these uh, really trying circumstances. Um, we're deeply grateful for your support at the City Council and the Committee on Veterans, and we look forward to further collaboration with you. I know I went over time, so I'll stop now. I'm so sorry. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Ashton. Um, I'm now going to turn it over uh, to Chair Dinowitz for questions for the panelists. Thank you. And, you know, before I ask my questions, Mr. Stewart, I just want to say thank you for sharing that story. Um, you know, I, th I think us in uh, these roles in the city council or at uh, city agencies, we do get caught up in the data and the numbers very often. Um, but it's about more, as you articulated, more than just a veteran receiving benefits and dollars from the city or from the state or federal government. Um, it's about considering yourself a veteran, being part of that veteran family. You know, and, and I think one thing was mentioned was military honors and burial rights. Um, so you know, while, while we do get caught up in the benefits that our heroes and their families uh, deserve, there is something more you know, intangible about it. So I, wanna, I just do wanna first thank you for, for sharing that story. Um, I, so unfortunately, go, going back to the numbers though, because, because we do wanna make sure that those veterans for whatever services and honors they deserve um, are getting those services. Um, we were talking about the data, the number of veterans accessing these services. In fact, Ms. Colhane um, alluded to this in her statement and I'm, you know, how many discharge service request upgrades have you all received this year? Um, this year, the number has been low because of the pandemic. So I, I would guess that that's also why DVS's numbers dropped. Um, I can tell you historically, like our first discharge upgrade was in 2011. Um, we had no idea what we were doing, I'll admit, uh, and started to see this need though and developed a program. We had the only out, like, really serious outreach we've ever done was in 2013. We had this huge intake um, and since then, I mean, at some point in 2017, our wait list of names had ballooned to like 650 or 700 vets. 
we then went through a very painful process of like cutting all of those names down to like 400 or so. We tracked that over an 18 month period. I think we cut, you know, 300 or so veterans, only one over 18 months found representation elsewhere in the entire country. To give you a sense of how, you know, that this is unique, what New York is doing. There is such a huge need, not just in New York City, but everywhere. Um, So in the last, you know, that 100 number that they cited for 2018, um, you know, I think is probably more predictive of what is to come. We average about probably 200, before the pandemic, we would average 200, 250 intakes per year without doing outreach, right? I mean, we would do trainings here and there and we would, but we, we don't put out flyer, you know, we don't conduct outreach for it just because the need is so huge. And we've had, we had a veteran move from Texas to New York so that we would take his case. Like that's, that's the kind of need we're talking about. Okay, can I, I'm sorry, just for a little clarity and then it'll be the same question for everyone else is the 200 is the number that you're able to address or the 200 is- <laughs> Right, the, the two hundred is just the calls. Yeah. And so, how many are you actually able to address? I, I say, um, I mean, and you're cutting lists down, and what is that based off of? I know these are a bunch of questions in one. Yeah. So what I'll say is, um, we developed. I mean, I'm, every organization has their own uh, mission and guidelines, right? We developed a criteria that was based on our mission being centering around um, mental health and things like that. Um, so we looked at where can we make the most impact in terms of benefits and psychological healing. Um, uh, so we focus our practice uh, with those things in mind. Um, you know, one of the things that we look at as well, um, just if you look at you know systemic racism, black men are disciplined at twice the rate of their counterparts. So over sixty percent of our clients are African American or identify or as black. So these things are all intertwined. So we look at whatever injustice, wherever we think there's a valid legal argument. Um, And then also where can we do the most good? So if someone has a general discharge, they served in the 1980s and they can access everything, we may not take their case because there's not a monetary benefit that we can gain for them. They're not, um, you know, we don't wanna rank people's trauma, but sometimes we, in, in effect, end up doing that a bit. Um, we want to, you know, who's in the most need is how it ends up um, happening. We also have a list of programs across the country, and we always provide that and say, try to set expectations about the wait list, about the years the process takes, and say, here are other resources if you'd like to go try to find that. We do strongly recommend that you find an advocate of some kind because this process is so difficult. Um, and that's, you know, I mean, it's, it's, it's really, it's really hard. It's really hard to say no. And, um, and that's why we're so grateful. We have 400 right now. We have 400 cases that are in some stage. I think, you know, when Jason mentioned the timeline, but we have a flow chart I'm happy to share with you that goes through the years long process. Um, I I would very much value that you sharing that. Thank you. Um, are the other panelists, same question? Sure. Uh, so I want to highlight something that Coco said towards the end, the this difficult decision of how you choose which cases that you can take on, I saw which I think is one of the, along, yeah. yeah, which is one of the like hardest choices that you need to make, realizing that we just don't have the resources to take on all of the cases that come in the door. And so being able to address things like stigma versus trying to really connect individuals with other than honorable discharges who really have this bar to all of the different benefits out there and deciding how we can prioritize to make sure that we can provide as many services as possible. Often it doesn't allow us to do full representation for clients that we otherwise would love to have fully represented. Instead, we're giving resources, we're providing steps, um, lists in terms of what they can do, different ideas of how they can strengthen their case. But a lot of the times it means that we're not gonna be able to represent them. Um, In the last year, we also saw a downtick in terms of number of callers for this issue. We were around a hundred callers. Um, I think it's a little bit skewed for us because of our our connection with the VA hospital themselves, that we have this medical legal partnership for, so a lot of our clients aren't necessarily coming in with discharge issues right off the bat. 
but we're really looking to expand and make sure that the community knows what we're doing. Um, we do get a lot of calls from different organizations, including one of our biggest partners, Samaritan Village, which is a substance abuse program for veterans that usually aren't able to access the VA's mental health and substance abuse programs. And so it, it's really just this ability to expand what we're already doing and being able to provide full representation, which is really the difference in these cases. If you're giving someone resources and helping in the small steps, yes, it makes a difference, but it doesn't make nearly the same difference as having an advocate making legal arguments, developing the evidence that you're gonna be submitting when you're actually in front of the boards. Uh, Mr. Stewart. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Um, we have had five this calendar year, five discharge up here rate requests. Um, one of them we referred to NILAG. Um, three of them have been Restoration of Honor Act uh, uh, upgrades and two are federal. Um, and last year, calendar year, we had 43 legal referrals that we made um, with nine legal victories, um, including one discharge upgrade. And might I also add that um, the punitive discharges, uh, I don't know how much thought has been, uh, I haven't heard it in the conversation yet other than Jason mentioning, um, mentioning them by name. Um, the restoration of honor process goes to the State Division of Veterans Services and they vet the, the circumstances and uh, unfortunately punitive discharges weren't included in the, the, the bill. And that's something that uh, we and some other advocates were, were unhappy with because there are times that people do receive a punitive discharge like that great example Jason gave that you know really need to be considered and evaluated um, before just being denied um, to, to give that person veteran status. So I hope that that will be considered um, at the city level as well. Thank you. And so it's, it sounds like there is an issue of, uh, of resources. Are there volunteer, do you have a training opportunities for volunteer attorneys, let's say, who wish to help? I, I had I a volunteer attorney. And, and sorry, and Craig, for me, I think panelists can stay unmuted um, because it, <laughs> I had a, <laughs> there you go. Yeah. Uh, Go ahead, I'm sorry, go ahead. Um, I had a volunteer attorney help us out with our first case just to go through the, the military files, um, but that was just to get me started. Basically, I've been doing this program a little more than three years. Um, and then we, we were able to give a really good proposal to VAP um, who took our the first case that we put together. Um, and I know that they're out there uh, for SAGE anyway, but I'd let Coco and, and Ryan take this. Yeah, we um, so we have a, a network of probably a hundred some different volunteer attorneys at various firms. Um, that's how we, we kind of launched our discharge upgrade clinic in 2012, 2013 as a pro bono model. Um, and so there that really, you know, expands our capacity. Um, but it's difficult because there are also um, a lot of clients that have various challenges and sometimes corporate attorneys aren't used to working with people who have experienced trauma. So there's, there can be some challenges yeah. and um, you know, that it takes resources to run those programs, I would say, but that's, it's a huge resource. And um, in terms of just adding on to Ashton's um, remark about the punitive discharges, um, that's something that we're trying to that as you said, advocates were all trying to change with the Restoration of Honor Act because they're excluded um, from that state bill. And um, it's something we're actually working in Connecticut with, they sort of originated the Restoration of Honor craze <laughs> um, and they're trying to reform it. So we're joining forces to hopefully uh, change that in New York. But um, the great thing about DBS is that, and I think about the bill they introduced is that it's every, they're including everyone. There's no exclusion. And I think that's really, really important. Thank you, Mr. Foley, anything to add? I, I echo a lot of what Coco says in terms of pro bono attorneys. They're a huge resource for us to be able to do the work they do, we do, um, but it's also a lot of training and it's also a lot of supervision to make sure those cases are going how they're supposed to be going. And so even if you have a million volunteers, you need somebody to make sure those volunteers are handling the cases appropriately and also able to kind of work with clients that have a lot of severe challenges, whether it be military sexual trauma, 
TBI, PTSD, or even things like uh, insecure housing situations, or even keeping in contact with the client is, is something that's a, a challenge in itself. And so we definitely have volunteers out there, but it's, it's really this requirement to need the expertise to be able to lead those volunteers to be able to have successful results for our clients. How, how many attorneys are on staff? Uh, currently for us, we have three attorneys that work within the VA itself. And then we have three attorneys that are outside of the VA. Okay. Um, so the VA specific attorneys wouldn't be able to handle these cases because of their uh, funding requirements. However, they're able to refer it outside to our program. So we're able to still assist those veterans. So, so essentially there are three attorneys working on all these cases. Correct. Okay. And what could the, the city do differently to support VSOs that provide um, legal assistance to veterans seeking to upgrade discharge status? I was gonna say, one of the things I think you touched on a little bit is outreach. I think it's, it's a very important to make sure that veterans across New York, as we have this expansion happening, know that this program is something that's out there and available for them, and that they're connecting them with all the other resources that are available for them. I think one of the challenges, and I know Coco talked about it a little bit too, is connecting individuals with mental health issues to mental health resources. And so making sure that right off the bat, one of the first things that is addressed for any client that comes in asking for this sort of assistance is also connecting them to the healthcare resources that are available. So, but even, I, I guess, even with the outreach, it seems that there's a staffing issue, right? Because there's this time, it sounds like you're already overwhelmed and you already have to I hate to say you have to turn people away. So even with all the outreach, that would just, in, seems like it would just increase the wait list and not necessarily the number of veterans that would be served. Yeah, I mean, personally speaking, like we don't, <laughs> we don't want any outreach, sadly, but, but I don't want to minimize what DBS is doing here, right? I mean, because our capacity is doubling or tripling and it's incredible. So I think, when for us, when we talk about outreach, it's more about like, there are resources for you for mental health. There are these other things. And I think um, in terms of like helping VSOs, you know, there's a tension there with um, how difficult these cases are. And so I know the state has started doing upgrades um, and it's, it's hard because veterans lose their shot. You know, if you lose at, there are different types of boards and you only have one shot at a personal appearance, which is the statistically best place to win, right? And if you burn that um, with someone who doesn't know what they're doing, which is what we're seeing, it's, it's unfortunate. So I think there's a, it's, it's hard. There's a tension there of like, where are you sending people when there aren't enough resources? Like, is something better than nothing? And anyway, I won't get into that. <laughs> but um, did want to just offer the dollar amount. Um, in terms of the investment that you had raised earlier. So for the top four benefits that our clients use, just looking at actual federal dollars coming in, um, it's right now, if you look at a single veteran with no dependents, um, and we did an estimate for looking at a veteran who's 28 and going averaging through age 80, um, it's $7.8 million over their lifetime. Um, and that doesn't include any employment or any of the you know, economic uh, advantages after receiving an education. So it's a pretty conservative number, in other words. Um, I can send you that data as well. Yes, please. That and the, uh, that thing. So it was a flow chart indicating mm -hmm. the, the timeline for all these things. Yeah. Um, I, I'm going to turn it back to committee council to call on other uh, council members for questions. Thank you, Chair. Um, I do not see that any council members have their hand raised right now, but I'm going to give it a moment. Um, as a reminder, council members have questions for a particular panelist. They should use the raise hand function in Zoom at this time. All right, I don't see any um, raised hand, so we will now uh, move on to our second public panel. Um, I would like to welcome Matthew Ribe. Um, from New York Presbyterian Military Families and, Families and Wellness Center. Matthew, I'm gonna ask you to unmute and you may begin once the um, Sergeant at Arms starts the clock. Time starts now. 
Uh, good morning, Chair Dinowitz, Council Members, Advocates. My name is Matt Reba. I'm a Marine Corps Combat Veteran of Iraq and Afghanistan, and I'm also the Director of Community Outreach and Education at Presbyterian's Military Family Wellness Center. Thank you for your, giving me the time to give testimony today, uh, and I want to speak on the importance of access to mental health for veterans with bad paper or other than honorable discharges. Although the total number of veterans struggling with service-connected mental health issues is unknown. Recent studies have shown that in the general veteran population, 15 to 30 percent already carry a diagnosis of PTSD or major depressive disorder. Or publicly available treatment, such as the VA healthcare system provides services, uh, this community, only about 50 percent of the veterans uh, actually use services at the VA because some refuse, others do not qualify at all. These numbers are most likely excluded uh, the very high risk population that we're discussing today, those who do not identify as veterans due to bad paper. So since 2016, the Presbyterian Military Family Wellness Center, directed by Drs. Yuval Neary at Columbia University and Joanne DeFeedy at Weill Cornell, have sought to bridge this treatment divide by providing cost-free, evidence-based assessment and treatment to local area veterans, active duty service personnel, and their adult family members, regardless of service era, disability rating, or discharge status. Since its inception, we have prioritized collaborations with regional public and private institutions seeking to complement existing resources rather than to compete or try to replace them. Uh, this includes VetConnect NYC. Since both of our clinics have been registered, we have received close to 50 patients uh, referrals from the DVS office and a good number of which who did not qualify for services elsewhere as a re result of their discharge status. Uh, I would like to highlight that it's important uh, both our clinics and with many of the other service providers listed on VetConnect and NYC to recognize that we're nonprofit organizations and we struggle to find funding in order to continue serving this veteran community in New York. Um, I'm going to skip ahead here just because of the time restraints. Uh, our innovative center has distinct advantages in four areas, ease of access, minim minimal bureaucracy, confidentiality, and privacy with a wide range of quality treatment options. And during COVID-19, we have been able to via our secure HIPAA compliant telemedicine platform, uh, provide these veterans their continued services for mental health from the safety of their homes. And recognizing this importance of the access to care issue for veterans benefits, our team at Columbia Psychiatry has formed a community partnership with the Veteran Advocacy Project. Our partnership will provide a vital resource to the city's veterans with less than honorable discharges as our programs combine psychiatry and advocacy to serve this population. While the idea of this collaboration began around discharge upgrades, it soon expanded and will assist veterans with bad paper in several ways, providing treatment, representation, therapy for family members that are not served by the VA, as well as evaluations for legal cases and more. With some further development, we hope that our Forensic Psychi Psychiatric Alliance with VAP will soon be a citywide asset for DVS and for the veteran families, the agencies looking to serve under the new DUALS program. Uh, the challenges facing our military families are enormous. Although the VA continues to provide most of the care to veterans, thousands of individuals seeking service-related mental health treatment in New York do not receive it. Both military families and veterans of bad people are especially vulnerable. We have a well-established record uh, through a focus on ease of access and privacy, uh, our high-quality services. We hope that our collaboration with the Veteran Advocacy Project and the City Department of Veteran Services, uh, we can expand our scope to serve this vital population. Uh, thank you for your time. I'll be happy to answer any questions you might have. Thank you so much, Matthew. Um, I'm now going to turn it over to Chair Dinowitz for some questions. Chair. Thanks, Ray. Thank you very much. Um, Mr. Ivett, can you talk a, a little more? You know, uh, you know, again, we're not just talking about veterans, we're talking about veterans and their families. Can you talk a little more about the services you provide both for individual veterans and, and what you're seeing in terms of families coming in for support or if that's work that you engage in? Absolutely. Um, so we provide a wide range of mental health services, uh, all related to military issues, whether it be military sexual trauma, PTSD, depression, anxiety, couples therapy, insomnia. Uh, about one third of our clients are military family members. Since we have started our operations in 2016, uh, we have seen north of 450 people come through the center for treatment. Uh, that's not including our research programs, which are separate because we do have uh, research programs that also have treatment options. So that number is probably somewhere north of 800 if you include all the research programs that we've done where people have gotten treatment in that same time frame. 
Um, and that's also not including the screenings. The screening is a separate process. So we see probably 800 to 1,000 screenings that have come through since we've started in 2016. And these are and these are people who have received other than honorable discharges? There is a subpopulation of that group because they can't get services anywhere else. Uh, we just offer our services to any veteran regardless. It's a very, very loose criteria. If you served one day in the military, you qualify for services at our clinics. Great. And do you see, and, and is, is any of that related to any, any of the reasons people are coming in related to um, they're not receiving those federal services? I mean, do, a, do you think that that adds to their, well, we'll please continue. There's a number of people, it's an access to care issue, uh, whether they don't qualify at the VA uh, or they just don't want to identify as a veteran within the VA system. Uh, I know that a lot of us on uh, the committee members here and, and the advocates are familiar with the RAND report that was commissioned a few years back by the uh, New York City, or excuse me, New York State Health Foundation. Um, and we know, you know, 50% of the veterans use the system. And of those 50%, I think in that year, it was 25% of those actually used it within that year. Uh, it's a lot of bureaucracy in the VA. Some veterans prefer not to use it. And we'd just like to kind of cover those gaps to ensure that there was another option for veterans and family members who don't qualify to use the VA to, to get that care. So I, I kind of want to separate two things. You said you, you spoke about veterans who don't want to use the VA mm -hmm. for bureaucratic reasons. And then people who don't want to identify as veterans. So can you talk a little more about the veterans who don't want to identify as veterans? Certainly. There's a there's a significant population of veterans who the trauma that they experienced uh, during service uh, causes them not to want to associate with that that group and a lot of it having to do with uh, there's certain levels with the this kind of ties back to bureaucracy as well when you're going to the VA system uh, the discharge paperwork is one thing that you may not qualify for services there's also people that just feel uncomfortable going there because of the way that they're treated i know that we've had a lot of uh female clients that have come through who are just not comfortable going to the va because of the the treatment they get not from the medical staff but just from other veterans or other people that are in the area um so they aren't people that outright identify as veterans they like to you know i'm sure ashton can speak to this with some of the people that he works with uh, maybe don't feel comfortable identifying with the majority of that population. So they find these smaller groups like our nonprofit to get their hair, their care from. Do you, do you find, so, you know, understanding um, that obviously the way someone is treated after giving of themselves and their family sacrifice, um, you know, you know, understanding those feelings, do you think um, there's that they don't have an honorable discharge? also leads to you know, resentment and additional mental health needs and then not wanting to be identified as a veteran? Could that, could that discharge status be the very cause of them not seeking out help and support both for, both for their internal mental health needs and also for uh, services that the city, state and federal government may or may not provide? I, I think that's absolutely part of the equation. We know that some of the symptomology of PTSD you know, is you become reclusive, you don't want to associate. Um, there's definitely a group of these veterans that we treat that the trauma was the cause, the root issue that caused the bad paperwork to begin with. So that PTSD already existed. They got reprimanded for it. They have a huge resentment towards the military because they lost their career because of something that was caused by the very career that they chose to serve. And now they can't get treatment that they seek afterwards. So it's it's definitely a, a snowballing issue that can start at that moment of trauma uh, for whether it be military sexual trauma, PTSD, or, or just any bad experience in the military. And in, and, and you know, we were speaking about this before with Mr. Stewart, both the, you know, fi the, the financial benefit of being a veteran, but also that internal honor of, 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 of being a veteran. Um, in your conversations uh, with, with um, veterans who receive other than honorable discharge, you know, could you put a number on it, like a percentage of how many of them, if given the opportunity, would seek to upgrade their discharge status and how many or what percent would, would just rather say, you know what, it was too traumatic for me to ever engage with it again? That's a good question. I don't know if I can put a, a percentage on it, but I would, 
I would like to think the majority of people would like to go through the process to upgrade because there's a significant amount of benefit to that. And you could, as the, the uh, state's legislation has shown, it's a restoration of the honor that you serve. And I think that plays a, a large part as well. Right, right. And, and, and again, I, personally, I think that the restoration of honor is, is the perfect term, both legal uh, and internal, that for the people you mentioned, uh, an internal struggle like mental health or their LGBTQ plus status should not be determinant of whether or not they receive uh, an honor. Uh, I'm going to turn it back to, thank you very much, Mr. Riba. I'm going to turn it back to committee council now. Thank you, Chair. Um, I will now turn it over. Um, I will give this opportunity for council members to ask questions if they have any. I would like to remind council members, if you have any questions for our panelists, please use your raise hand function in Zoom and I will call on you in the order in which you have raised your hand. Um, let me give it a second here. Okay, seeing as there are um, no uh, questions from council members, I would like to announce that if we have inadvertently missed anyone that has registered to testify today and has yet to have been called, please use the uh, Zoom raise hand function now and you will be called in the order that your hand has been raised. Okay, seeing as there are no one, uh, no other panelists today, I'm going to turn it over to the chair who will give closing remarks. Chair. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I, I want to thank everyone uh, for attending this hearing today, whether it's at DVS, the advocates for their testimony, fellow council members uh, for their attendance and questions, committee council and uh, other staff members. Um, and I want to extend my, my deepest thanks to veterans for their service and their families for their sacrifice. Uh, you know, we often say that we often go up to veterans and say thank you for your service. But saying thank you, uh, as we know, is, is not enough. We have to show our thanks. And that means ensuring all veterans and families are provided the resources and support, regardless of discharge status. Um, that is what we in the council, are at, the advocates and DVS are seeking, are seeking to do. Uh, and I look forward to working with DVS, with my fellow council members, with all the advocates to make sure that all those veterans who deserve that honorable discharge, who were discharged because of you know, reasons out of their control, um, receive the, the honor they deserve and the resources that they deserve. Chair, I'm going to ask that you gavel out now and close the proceedings. <laughs> Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Smita, you can end the hearing. You can close the Zoom. Thanks. I was just confirming something.